Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another week with uh, live with Dr. McDougall. And uh, we're very excited, as usual, to have Dr. McDougall here with us. For those of you who are joining us the first time, Dr. McDougall is a, a physician, a, a real doctor that uh, sees real patients. Uh, he's not an um, alternative medicine doctor, and he treats uh, illnesses in, in many traditional ways, but he also treats uh, illnesses that are diet related with a change in food. And that's when he uh, talks about the starch solution. I hope all of you have his book and have read it many times. I think it's, it's his masterpiece. So if you don't have it, please uh, get it as soon as possible. So Dr. McDougall is right now in uh, California and we welcome you today. Thank you for making the time to be with us uh, every week, Dr. McDougall. Well, How are you? It's, it's my privilege I've been there to talk to so many people uh -huh. um, and to answer their questions. Uh, what, what better opportunity can I have? I, mean, I, go, I go to, or used to, when I traveled more, I uh, used to go to conferences uh, where my audience would be 30, 40 people, and I would appreciate it very much just to have their attention. But now, I mean, we could get, you know, one, two, four, seven thousand people listening to these conferences almost effortlessly thanks to the technology. Um, I, in fact, I am going to travel. I'm doing two conferences coming up in April, one for a naturopathic organization uh, in Portland. And you can find this uh, on my website under the discussion board. And the other one will be to an obesity med medicine conference, April 7th in San Francisco, uh, which will be kind of interesting because uh, I don't know whether they know who they're inviting. <laughs> these, these are traditional doctors uh, who are, just, who are uh, you know, trying to help the world solve obesity problems. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I'm going to point out to them, and people call this fat shaming, I'm going to point out to them that most of their uh, speakers are uh, overweight or obese, and I'm going to show that video uh, that's uh, been quite popular called uh, Low Carb Versus Plant Food, which shows uh, the different experts uh, and what they look like, like Lauren Cordain of the Paleo Diet looks fat and sick, as for years, Sally Fallon of Western Price, fat and sick, um, William Davis of Wheat Belly, fat and sick, uh, Robert Atkins, fat and sick, you know, so on all of these uh, so-called uh, uh, experts that recommend low carb diets. And I contrast them with our uh, camp, which are people like Neil Bernard and Pam, Pam, Pam Popper and uh, Esselstyn and so on, all trim and uh, thin looking. So you might, might want to look at that video. It's on YouTube and also someplace on our website. But I'm going to show that at this April 7th conference uh, if they don't pull me. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, yes, I, 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 it's such a privilege to talk to folks on uh, the webinar. Before we get started with the subject today, I, I did send out a notice to all of you, and hopefully you, uh, you got it and paid attention to it. And it was called a breaking news uh, item. And I sent it out a couple of days ago because uh, the uh, Canadian Task Force on Preventive Medicine Healthcare, on Preventive Healthcare, uh, from the Canadian Medical Association Journal on February 25th, 2016, said no more colonoscopies. They're too dangerous and ineffective. So we have an official uh, uh, preventive medicine organization tied to the Canadian government and medical association telling you to stop getting colonoscopies for cancer screening. Now, I've been telling you this for more than two decades. And I wrote an article to all of you who were subscribers at that time, uh, called Colonoscopy a Gold Standard to Refuse. And it's in my August 2010 newsletter. And it explains the things that this panel obviously have looked at about how dangerous these tests are, how unproductive they are, how financially rewarding they are to device companies, doctors, hospitals, et cetera. Uh, it, this uh, official recommendation from the uh, Canadian Task Force on Preventive Healthcare should be the beginning of stopping this barbaric procedure, which kills people and offers uh, very little benefit, uh, certainly no more benefit than doing a sigmoid exam, a stool for uh, blood or a new test called a Cologuard. So I recommend people do one of these or all of these three uh, around the age of 60 and stay away from these uh, colonoscopy uh, uh, doctors, uh, they're in it for the buck. 
and they hurt people. And the Canadian uh, Preventative Medicine Task Force tells you the same thing. And quickly we'll follow from the uh, U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. I mean, when the truth is out and somebody has the guts to stand up and tell the truth, then uh, the followers follow. So you'll hear it again from others. But I want to tell you, there's going to be a great backlash because there's a ton of money involved in doing these tests. So don't expect to hear controversy uh, uh, about this new recommendation. But to get to this far and to tell the public not to do this because it's dangerous and uh, uh, relatively ineffective uh, is a big deal. And that's why I sent you out that special notice. So what were we going to talk about today, Castello? Well, today, thank you for that. It's a very, very important. I, how can uh, how can people get that email that you sent? They, they need to be subscribed to your they newsletter, to, right? I have subscribed, uh, but it's probably someplace on my website under under breaking news. I think there's a section okay. called breaking All news. Right. Or, <clears throat> but you can also go, uh, the Canadian Medical Association Journal is a free access journal. Uh, and uh, you will be able to, in a few days, you'll be able to go to the Canadian Medical Association Journal website. And uh, they hadn't been published last time I looked. Uh, they were published February 25th, 2016. But my access, library access, didn't allow me to see the guidelines yet. Uh -huh. They were a, a week behind. So sometime uh, this week, maybe next week, they should be at that uh, uh, source, which you can find on the internet. You should be able to see the official guidelines. Or easily, easily, you can go to Google right now and uh, put in oh, colonoscopies uh -huh. and the Canadian uh, Preventive right. Services Task Force or Preventive Task Force. And you can find it on Google very, very, very easily. Good. Okay. Well, today, uh, there is a kind of a controversial, in a way, uh, topic because so many people are unfairly just confused by the media and the doctors, even doctors within the plant-based uh, world that I call, uh, giving so much conflicting information when it comes to fat. And you have always said the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And why don't we start there and maybe just explain in a little bit what you mean when you say that to people and then we'll go with the questions. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I know there's a lot of uh, conflicting information. And that, of course, is why I told you about the video, which I'm going to show at this big uh, obesity <laughs> right. medicine conference, uh, just so you can see it. I mean, the people who recommend uh, eating oil, like Andrew Weil and uh, you know, the other people I mentioned, uh, they're fat. Open your eyes. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. When you say consume uh, olive oil, uh, say a cup of it, which you wouldn't do because you'd probably throw up. But say you put it in your salad, a, a half a cup or a cup of olive oil, and you're able to get it down that way with a little add salt. Uh, where do you think that oil goes? Do you think it like evaporates from your ears? You know, it comes out of the, of the sweat in your feet. Where do you think that oil goes? Uh, it goes to uh, under your skin, which means your body fat. And it goes on your skin, which means greasy skin and greasy hair and acne. And I mean, be real. Uh, this is not like some magical thing where this uh, substance that you take in just disappears. Oh, yeah, you can see some of it in your toilet is greasy stool. Sure. But most of it is stored because that's the purpose of fat. It's the metabolic dollar that is stored for the day when no food is available. But that just doesn't seem to happen in Europe or Australia or the United States. So you're storing just a whole load of fat. And you can see this <clears throat> in various studies that are done. And they're cited in, uh, I've got the newsletter here someplace. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, oh, let's see. Yeah, it's in uh, my March 2009 newsletter. The references are there where you see uh, how investigators will take and biopsy people's body fat. And they'll find that uh, their body fat reflects what they eat. For example, if they eat diets high in uh, uh, fish, omega-3 uh, rich fish, that when they body biopsy their body fat, they find their body fat is full of omega-3 fats. Uh, they uh, look for trans fats, say you eat margarines or uh, shortenings, and when they biopsy your abdomen, thighs, or buttocks, and they analyze the fat, what they find is they find these trans fats. So you see that what people eat in their diet, when you biopsy their body fat, those fats are there. And you can get the references in my March 2009 newsletter. 
Uh, think, <laughs> think about just some numbers here. Uh, uh, the uh, concentration, calorie concentration in fat and oil. When I say fat, I mean like animal fat and vegetable oil and cod liver oil and safflower oil. I'm talking about all of them. They're all equal. Uh, if you look at the calorie concentration, uh, fats and oils are nine calories per gram, the most dense of all foods. If you look at meat and cheese, there are four calories per gram, about. Uh, if you look at uh, pure white sugar, it's four calories per gram. If you look at starch, like rice, corn, potatoes, they're a little over one calorie per gram, okay? Now, people, when people say, well, when McDougall misquoted, and uh, <laughs> he said that uh, starches are four calories per gram because all they're thinking of is white sugar. Well, excuse me, starch is a mixture of complex sugars and fibers, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why they're one calorie per gram. So you're talking about nine fold increase in calorie mm -hmm. consumption per volume. Right. Why would you not think the fat you eat is the fat you wear? The other thing about fat that's really important, and again, you'll see this in my March 2009 newsletter, you can look, look up the references yourself, is uh, the body doesn't notice fat when you eat it. Uh, there's no satiety response from fat. Uh, and the reason is, is uh, you know, fat is a uh, commodity that is usually rare, has been throughout human, uh, uh, human development and evolution. Uh, fat was a, uh, a special thing that you found. You know, you found a dead carcass or you know, the avocado tree came in bloom. And it was uh, special because it added uh, extra calories so you could get through the winter or times of famine. Uh, by that natural design, there's really no turnoff when you eat fat. You can store fat endlessly. Whereas the body responds to carbohydrate. And uh, that's how you satisfy your hunger drive. But it has no response to fat. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, if you're going to get satisfied, uh, you need to eat the carbohydrate, which is where you get uh, your, your feedback and your turnoff. We have uh, many drives, some we would kill for, even though we don't need them to survive. Like, for example, we would kill for sex and for money, for position in our uh, businesses. But we don't need to do, satisfy those drives to live. There are only three drives we need to satisfy to stay alive. And they are breath, which is satisfied by your thinking air. <laughs> Not so. It's satisfied by oxygen. Only oxygen satisfies breath. And there is thirst. And you're thinking beer, fruit juice. No, it's only satisfied by water. And then when I mentioned the third drive, you need to stay alive, which is hunger. You say food. Wrong answer. It's carbohydrate that satisfies the hunger drive. The body doesn't notice fat, as I said. It notices its feedback mechanisms out of carbohydrate. So if you are um, <clears throat> constantly hungry to the point where you think you have a disease, a mental disease, an emotional disease, you call yourself an obsessive compulsive overeater because, because what you notice is that you sit down and eat and eat and eat and you get up from the dinner table and you still want to eat. Well, it's because you've been trying to get satisfaction from fatty foods. I used to do that when I ate the American diet. I would sit down to a plate of meat and cheese and oily stuff and I'd eat my first plate and I, I pick big plates. Let me tell you, <laughs> I eat uh, my first plate and I hardly notice anything different. And so I get a second plate. And then after the second plate, I notice a little bit of fullness in my abdomen but I'm still hungry. So I get a third plate of carbohydrate deficient foods. There's no carbohydrate in meat, cheese, uh, seafood, etc. They're virtually carbohydrate deficient. Carbohydrates are sugar. Sugar is present in starches, corn, rice, potatoes, uh, some fruits, etc. So I get my third carbohydrate deficient meal based on animal foods and oils. And uh, finally, I notice something that tells me I have to stop eating. And that is that I'm overstuffed and in pain, mm -hmm. but I'm still ravenously hungry. If I could find room for one more pork chop, I'd shove it in. <laughs> right. So, you know, you think you've got a mental emotional disorder. Probably you do <laughs> at various levels, but the fact that you aren't satisfied 
by eating has to do with the fact that you haven't eaten. You've eaten things that don't satisfy your drives. So you have to, <clears throat> you have to change to get appetite satisfaction, which is high carbohydrate foods. Uh, you have to change uh, from calorie dense foods. I told you fats, nine calories per gram, starch is one calorie per gram. And you have to stay away from, you have to uh, deal with the concept that the fat you eat is the fat you wear because that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to be stored. So uh, uh, it just moves from your mouth or as uh, some famous, famous actress used to say, it goes from my lips to my hips. <laughs> Get real folks, right. that has changed. And people who come out and make uh, recommendations that you need fat to be healthier and lose weight, uh, <clears throat> They're, they're dealing with, uh, with false concepts. And uh, if they have data, it's data paid for by some industry or special interests. Uh, I don't know why so people who I see as relatively intelligent uh, make these recommendations to the public. Uh, maybe they just wanna keep in the spotlight. Uh, maybe wanna, they wanna get the public to buy their newest book. You know, that, that's what the media does too. Uh, the media, when it sees a, uh, information that uh, carbohydrates are bad and fat is good, like the June 2014 cover of Time magazine that said, uh, the experts are wrong, eat butter. Uh -huh, yes. you know, why, why, why would they do that? Why would they go against uh, 100 years of scientific research and obvious concepts that eating butter, which is nearly 100% fat, is good for you and it's full of saturated fat? Why would they do that? And the only thing that I can think of is Time Magazine and these other media outlets, uh, they, want, they want to sell books. And the way they sell books uh, is they get the public's attention and the public wants to hear that they can eat uh, butter and cheese and bacon. You know, people love to hear good news about their bad habits. Right, <laughs> right. So how, let, me, let me ask you something, Dr. McDougall, that several people have asked before, and it's how they, they want to be able to understand how people that eat a high fat diet, um, some many of them lose weight and are thin. Is it that they're actually getting sick? Well, I think there are several reasons. First of all, not many do. When 80% of Americans are overweight and 38% are now declared obese. <laughs> You're talking about a very small number of people. Uh, some people are moderate. Like uh, I remember my, uh, great-grandmother. She died at 106. She said it wasn't worth it after 90, by the way. Uh, I used to go over to her house, which was next door, and she'd just ask, she'd say, why didn't God take me last night? You know, I, I really have no purpose here on earth anymore. But anyway, I remember one uh, discussion we had together. Uh, it lasted uh, over the day. Uh, <clears throat> she said to me, she said, and this is after I'd become vegan. So and I can't tell you how many years ago, but it's over 20 years ago. She said to me, Johnny, I want you to go out and get me a burger. And uh, it was a common, commonly consumed burger. It was uh, one that was made with uh, two white bread buns, a, uh, a paper thin uh, a slab of ground beef, pickles and mustard, and uh, sold in a, in a wrapper. <laughs> about this big and you know, it was yellow. You know what I mean? Anyway, I, I brought it home and um, I, I gave it to her and she cut this uh, burger into quarters. And she looked at me and she said, took one quarter, by the way, took it and shook it in my face. And she said to me, you know, if you'd eat a little more meat, you'd be healthier. And then she proceeded to eat two quarters of that one burger. And she put it the rest of the way for, rest of the way for later. You see, she was a moderate person. I can't do that. I went to the same restaurant. I ordered two quarter pounders and a, a malt shake or two. So there are some people who are moderate, like my great grandmother. She lived to be 106 on, quote, the Western diet. Never drank uh, or maybe a little glass of wine at Christmas. And uh, so that's why some people are thin eating unhealthy foods. Uh, some people eating those foods make them so sick they can't gain weight. And uh, that's, I mean, diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, terrible indigestion. I mean, every grocery store and uh, drug store you walk into, they're selling you Prilosec and Nexium right over the counter because, and so many people, I don't know how many take this stuff. And they, I guess 30, 40% of people are on these antacids. They're sick, their body is uh, rebelling. 
So they lose weight because they're ill. Right. And then there are some genetic issues. I mean, some people have a tendency to gain fat easier than others. So I, I would guess those are, are, are the reasons that 20% uh, of Americans aren't overweight. <laughs> and by the way, that prediction is, is uh, to change by uh, 2030. It's predicted that uh, uh, nearly 50% of people in this country will be obese. And in some parts of the country, like the Southeast, excuse me, this, yes, the Southeast, uh, Missouri, Mississippi, Louisiana, the obesity rates are expected to be over 70%. Mm -hmm, so right. when you say, how, why do some people not get fat on the American <laughs> diet? They're diminishing, you know, it's not very many. Right, but the, but the, um, uh, the Atkins diet, for example, yeah. well, that, I've, I've heard you explain how uh, the body is getting sick, actually. And it's, uh, can you the Atkins sense? diet, Atkins diet. Uh, works. It's it's a diet of no carbohydrate, of uh, originally advertised as bacon, butter, and brie. Mm -hmm. By the way, I knew Dr. Atkins. Uh, I knew him. Uh, I met him on personal occasions. And if you go to my website, you'll see an interview, mm -hmm. uh, a radio show interview that I did with Dr. Atkins, which was published on my website. <clears throat> uh, there were only two things we could agree on, and one that all his patients were constipated. And the other was at that time, all medical doctors and organizations thought what he did was terrible. Of course, that's changed. And I'll see that at the obesity conference on April 7th. There are a lot of promoters of these high meat diets. And of course, as I say, a uh, good share of the speakers and attendees are, are overweight and obese. Now, I can forgive the attendees, but to have a speaker on stage advising physicians and scientists and the public uh, to eat these uh, sickening, obesity-forming foods should not be allowed. There should be a rule against this. It would be like going to a, a conference on uh, on uh, lung disease and lung cancer and having the speaker stand up on stage and smoke a cigarette. Shouldn't be allowed. But anyway, uh, where was I going? Yes, yes, with um, uh, Atkins diet. Oh yeah, well, how does the Atkins diet work? Yes. As I say, I, I I I was on a panel with him. Uh, in 2000, uh, USDA panel on, uh, on food is broadcast worldwide. <clears throat> and before I, uh, while I was preparing for that conference, uh, uh, Mary, my great advisor, I said to Mary, I said, look, Atkins is going to stand up and say his diet is uh, so effective and easy to follow. I said, Mary, when he does that, because I knew he was, knew he was going to do that. I said, I, and I was sitting right next to him. I said, uh, I'm going to stand up and say, Show us how effective it is. Stand up and take your coat off. But Mary said I couldn't do that. Well, you know what? That's one of the great regrets I have in life that I didn't do that. I won't make that mistake again. How does the Atkins diet work? Well, <clears throat> first of all, uh, the, body, uh, the body stores carbohydrate because it needs it for brain function. Uh, exclusively, the red blood cells use carbohydrate. They won't use any other fuel. And there are some kidney cells that won't use anything but sugar to burn. So the body has to uh, rely upon sugar sources that are stored called glycogen. They're stored particularly in the muscles and liver. Uh, there are about two pounds of glycogen stored uh, in the muscles and liver. And associated with every molecule of glycogen are two molecules of water in terms of weight. Uh, it, so when you go on the Atkins diet, it's a carbohydrate-free diet and carbohydrate produces glycogen. So the body uh, uses the glycogen stores, burns them maybe in two or three days. <clears throat> so you've lost two pounds of glycogen associated with four pounds of water loss. And so you've lost six, eight, 10 pounds of weight within three or four or five days. You go, ah, nirvana, I've discovered the secret. Uh, after the glycogen stores are gone, then the body must rely on fat. And a byproduct of fat metabolism uh, is ketones. And you go into a state called ketosis. Uh, ketosis occurs under two natural circumstances. One is if you're sick and uh, your body, uh, when it gets sick, it, it needs to recuperate, to rest, not to go out find, looking for foods. And so you lose your appetite with ketosis. It's a natural reaction to being sick. So that's why one of the reasons I say that Atkins diet makes you sick, it puts you in ketosis. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, you lose your, the other way you go into ketosis is if you're starving to death. The body goes into ketosis because it's burning fat 
And when you're starving, the body wants to conserve energy. So you lose your appetite again, so you can survive longer. You're not out looking for food. So that's how ketosis occurs naturally. Well, you can induce ketosis by going on a low carb diet, which is by the way, the Atkins diet. It's the grain brain diet. It's the wheat belly diet. They're all ketosis. They're, right. they're mimics of the Atkins diet. Don't fool yourself, folks. So anyway, you lose your appetite and you stay on the diet as long as you can be sick. Well, people can't do it very long. They can't stay sick uh, in ketosis long. And so they eventually give up and they get fat again. They, they have a, a real high rate of weight gain, uh, a la Dr. Atkins himself. <laughs> you know, that was a, he died and I, of course, got, I got uh, involved in national publicity with this. I was on the front page of the New York Times uh, and on many other shows. Uh, but when he died, he was uh, 60 pounds overweight. Uh, you know, we belly, uh, uh, William Davis, I don't know if he's 60 pounds overweight, but he's darn close to that. You want to see what a wheat belly is, take a look at the author of the wheat belly. You know, uh, they, they can't work. They can't work for because people don't just don't have the stamina to stay stick and to stay away from appetite mm -hmm. satisfying delicious carbohydrates. Right. But what does work and has worked for 9.5 of the 10 billion people who've walked on this earth is a starch based diet. You know, there used to be no fat Chinese before 1980. The records are fewer than 1% of the Chinese who were type 2 diabetic. That means virtually none. <clears throat> Now, uh, the statistics are that, uh, this is published in JAMA in 2013, is that 12% of uh, Chinese are diabetic, it's probably more now, and half are pre-diabetic. And what changed in 35 years? You know, they stopped eating the rice and they start, they're the richest country around. Richest country, I, saw, I read some data on the news yesterday about the wealth of the Chinese. They've surpassed mm -hmm. the wealth of the United States. Right. And it shows in their physical appearance. Um, so anyway, there have been, uh, Billions of people who live successfully on starch-based diets. We've talked about the Mayans and the Aztecs living on corn. The people in the Andes living on potatoes. Uh, the Middle East is known as the breadbasket of the world. Look at the news tonight. Look at the people in Syria, Iran, and Iraq. Except for the princes and the princesses and the kings and queens. They're all trim. Scary, by the mm -hmm. way. So... Uh, you can't stay on a diet that is unnatural for human beings. We are not carnivores. Uh, these uh, foods, the meats, the dairy, uh, the oils that are recommended are sickening. Uh, they cause cancer and heart disease. So does the Heart Association and Cancer Society say. Uh, <clears throat> they cause uh, infectious problems by transmitting microbes to you. Mm -hmm. They're the highest, uh, highest level of contaminants. Uh, because they're the highest on the food chain. We talked about the Eskimos and how uh, the Eskimo tissues and uh, breast milk is a toss it should be considered to toxic waste hazards. Uh, the Eskimo woman secretes a breast milk that is uh, five to 10 times higher than uh, a woman say who lives in, uh, in Canada, in Southern Canada, because the Eskimos live on this Atkins all meat diet. Right. Anyway, the, I could go on and on and we could talk yes. about animal abuse. We could talk about the environment. Uh, why do uh, so-called experts uh, try and divert the public's attention from the truth? I don't know what their motivation is, but I know they're wrong. And I have no hesitation in challenging them. Well, you know, and right now there is uh, the fat summit going on and uh, doctors uh, that are quite well known and people are very confused and many of them are upset at, at this. Uh, how, how do you explain that some of these doctors are given such uh, dangerous advice as to, oh, eat all the fat you want? Well, most of the, some of the doctors that you're thinking about, uh, that I think about, who are at this fat conference, uh, they change their recommendations almost yearly. Uh, right now, they're into eating good fats and good oils. Uh, fortunately, a part of that fat conference was Neil Bernard. And what I've heard, I haven't listed this part, but he tried to straighten the public out about this kind of fat eating. Uh, yeah, it's dangerous, but as I say, the public wants to hear some new trick, you know, something that's been, been being hidden from them for all these years that accounts for them being obese. And maybe it's I've been not eating enough fat and good oil. Uh, the public is desperate. They want to be well. 
And uh, so every new gimmick that comes out, uh, many of them are going to buy into. But it makes no sense at all. The uh, scientific data, as I told you, what I tell you, my March 2009 newsletter, or the Star Solution book is absolutely clear. Your worldwide observations, I'll look at India, China, uh, Bangladesh, Chile. Well, look, look, look what's happened. In the last 35 years, the uh, intake of uh, animal foods, dairy and meat in particular, and the intake of vegetable oil has more than doubled. Uh, right now, we have a worldwide serious epidemic of uh, obesity and cancer and heart disease and type 2 diabetes. Uh, you think this is just an a, uh, a, uh, unimportant correlation, some, some, uh, something that happened independent? You know, wake up. It's right before your eyes. Not only the fact that uh, populations throughout eons of human history, which we can date back, by the way, to 2.6 million years ago for hominoids, and easily 100,000 years ago, show you that the human being is a starch eater, lives on rice, corn, potatoes, etc. cetera. Uh, you can look at that aspect and you can also look at what's happened to the world today. You, you people have, are, watch the news, you travel internationally, open your eyes. Don't be, don't be uh, dissuaded by people, whatever their intention is. It's obvious what's going on. Right, right. What, what kind of, um, how can we, the public, uh, have a tool to kind of tell one thing from the other. For example, some, one of the uh, people watching uh, asks a question about Dr. Heyman, who wrote a book, uh, Eat Fat, Get Thin. And so, and of course, he presents uh, a science behind it and studies. How, how can we tell if those studies are, are, are really true? I mean, what can yeah. we do? Well, I'm not uh, totally familiar with Mark Heyman's work, but uh, he wants, uh, you know, thought the whole problem was sugar. And now he switched to oil as being the focus of attention. As I say, there are many doctors out, out there that flip flop. And I have to believe that some of their motivation is if they come up with something new, they'll be able to sell a book. I've been asked to do this, by the way. Mm -hmm, uh, back right. in uh, the 19, uh, 1990s, my uh, uh, book company, uh, which was uh, uh, Penguin Putman, uh, I was one of the top 5% booksellers at uh, this uh, particular famous book company. <clears throat> and uh, in 1990, they came to me and they said, uh, we want you to change your focus. But we want you to write a low carb diet book this time it's, instead of a high carb diet book. And I said, uh, you know, what do you think? I just do this for money. Uh, and I said, besides that, it's never gonna happen. The pendulum is never gonna swing back to uh, uh, low carb diets. and. Uh, I know this to be true because the science is absolutely consistent. Uh, the observations put in the Bible and other religious books are absolutely consistent. Uh, historical observations are absolutely consistent. It couldn't possibly happen that people would go back to the Atkins type of eating. Well, folks, I was wrong. You know, I was wrong. Uh, they did do it, but I did not change. And uh, I think now we're swinging back to a uh, a more humane type of eating, a, a type of eating that is extremely important in terms of saving the planet. Uh, I think these uh, low carbers have been uh, exposed. Uh, and uh, this new old idea about eating oil, the fat, some of it, et cetera, is uh, uh, I'm sure I didn't get invited. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I have. Uh, anyway, well, it makes, it makes no sense at all. If you want to find some new trick to lose weight, keep looking. But it's obvious you right before it. your eyes. It's talked about in the Bible. It's talked about in all religious teachings. It uh, goes back to uh, the scientific literature before the food and drug companies owned the journals, which, by the way, took place in about 1980. 70% mm -hmm. of the journal articles published on food are paid for by interests in the food uh, industries. So back when science was really science, all of it's consistent. Uh, if you want to look for the, at the advertisements that have been published since the 1980s, which is what the journals contain, it's advertisements from the food and drug industries, you know, whatever. Right. But, you right. know, I bet if you just eat what I suggest and what Mary recommends uh, to put together in the recipes, I bet if you just do it for seven days, you'll find the truth yourself. Your bowels will start working. Your greasy skin will go away. Your pimples mm -hmm. will heal up. 
your blood pressure will come down, your uh, blood sugars will improve, uh, you'll get increased energy, you'll you'll start performing like an Olympic uh, winning athlete, which by the way, we've talked about how uh, the Kenyans have dominated since 1968, the long distance events. We've talked about the gladiators being the barley men who lived on barley and beans. You'll get that kind of energy back, that kind of health back, you'll get your appearance back. So if you don't believe, just give it a seven day challenge. Right, just seven days. What do you got to lose? Nothing. Except, except a whole bunch of fat. <laughs> Right. And you get your life back and you'll save a whole bunch of money, too, because the foods that I recommend are very cheap. You'll drop your food bill by about one fourth. Of right. What it was. You know, in other words, you know, you'll spend 80 percent, 60 percent less than you did before. Oh, that's for sure. I noticed it immediately. <laughs> Um, Dr. McDougall, someone says that they have um, been following the, your McDougall program for four years and have lost 50 pounds and uh, that this person doesn't eat any added fat. And the question is, is it really safe to never eat nuts, seeds or avocados? Absolutely. All the fat you need is in the basic starches. Um, there's, there's never been a case of fat or fatty acid deficiency ever reported on a natural diet. Uh, the only case of fatty acid deficiency I've ever uh, uh, encountered was when in the 1930s, uh, they invented formulas for babies and the babies started getting fat on these high fat formulas you know, to replace breast milk. And so what the uh, uh, doctors recommended was we take the fat out of the baby's formulas and these babies developed a fatty acid deficiency. Uh, cracks in their skin. I mean, it was a whole problem. But fatty acid deficiency or fat deficiency has never occurred on any natural diet ever. Our uh, requirements for fat are uh, less than 1% of the calories. Uh, vegetable foods uh, contain about uh, half their calories as essential fat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are corn is uh, about 10% fat. Potatoes are 1% fat, beans, peas, and lentils about 4% fat, loads of fat. You'll never see a case of fatty acid deficiency on natural foods. Right. Uh, if you add nuts, seeds, avocados, uh, I don't think it's unhealthy, but they're 90% fat. What reasonable person would think that if you ate a significant amount of food that's 90% fat, it wouldn't affect your skin, which you'll notice in just a couple of days becomes uh, softer, so to speak, oilier and uh, wouldn't affect your body fat. Uh, the studies done showing that fat doesn't make, or excuse me, nuts and seeds, or nuts in particular, by the way, most of them are paid for by the nut industry. Right. Uh, the studies that show that uh, limit the nut intake to uh, one ounce of nuts a day or less, or they also, as a part of the experiment, decrease the calorie intake from other foods. This is fraudulent science. Uh, it's paid for by the nut industry and people buy into it because People love to hear good news about their bad habits. They do. They yeah. really do. So tell me, I, and that not, not, they do not eat uh, uh, unprocessed nuts. They hear nuts are good. So they buy a can of these salted, greasy almonds and say, see, look what I'm doing. I'm eating nuts. That's good for me. Uh, industry's winning, winning. Right, right. What about having your... Um... Uh, someone says here, should I at least have my omega-3 fatty acid levels checked, like my doctor suggests, and take DHA supplements? No. no. I, no. Wish I, I, I wish I could use the word bullshit on this. Uh, <laughs> some people would get upset with me, so I won't do that. Well, you well. Know, it's just absolutely not. You shouldn't have, and you shouldn't be taking DHA. <laughs> you're, making, you're making all, all the fat essential fat, elongated essential fats like EP, EPA and DHA, you make it from alpha linoleic acid, uh, which is the basic ALA is made by plants. Uh, I will never, I will, please me, I, I know I'll get two or three newsletters because of my profane <laughs> language. And I will try and refrain myself from using science oh. very different words. But sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, it's it gets so frustrating. It does. That I have to put up with this kind of nonsense from people. Again, if you're looking for the magic bullet, the thing that you missed, the new science that's going to come out and save you, and then you're not going to buy into this. Right. If you're looking for the truth, the truth is everywhere. Yes. You and know, exactly. Um, there is something kind of funny that uh, uh, 
someone submitted here says that Dr. Ornish um, suggests eating a serving of cashews. And according to him, a serving of cashews is two cashews. Do you think it's possible for people to eat just two? Yeah, I, I don't know. You know Dean's, <laughs> Dean's been a friend for a long time. I have a lot of friends who disagree with me. Michael Greger, right. Dean Ornish, uh, uh, Dr. Esselstyn. <clears throat> You know, SE recommends never eat a nut, seed or avocado. Uh, Gregor recommends uh, eating some. Uh, I'm glad er not everybody agrees with me. It gives us some points of discussion. <laughs> right. And the same thing with Dean Arnie. She and I have been uh, professional, not personal, but pro professional friends. Since we published our first books in the early 80s, we used to go on book tours together, so to speak. We'd both be doing the rounds at the same time. And... Uh, Dean has some recommendations that I don't agree with, and I'm sure, sure uh, well, obviously it would be the opposite, the same. He doesn't, doesn't agree with all the things that I recommend. Uh, doesn't mean I don't want these people as friends on my team, right, and I have respect for them, uh, but, you know, I, w I don't hesitate ever in my books, on my newsletter, and so on, to defend my point of view. Right. When it comes to fish, I wrote a great article uh, in my newsletter and in the Start Solution called Confessions of a Fish Killer. I used to be a fish killer. Uh, the ocean was mine. I used to uh -huh. spear and uh, hook fish, uh, do terrible things to the ocean. Uh, once I uh, uh, was able to open my eyes and see clearly, uh, that's uh, something I, uh, I seriously regret in my past, that I had uh, such disrespect uh, for the animal life in the ocean. I felt it was my birthright to do whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. And so it is these days, and I've written in the Starch Solution book, <clears throat> is that if I had a choice between eating a cow's leg or, or a pig's shoulder and fish, I would definitely kill the cow and the pig first. Uh, I won't eat anything from the ocean. Uh, I don't do many things on moral principles. I do them based on, uh, you know, the things that I intelligently know, but this is something I do on moral principle. I will not ever eat anything from the ocean, except maybe seaweed. Right. <laughs> okay. Very good. I'm ashamed, I'm ashamed of what I did. And there is a chapter about that in your book. There is, and and yeah. it's also uh, in the in the website for free. Right. Do you um do you or your wife Mary eat any added fat or like adding flax seed or chia seeds in your oatmeal? Do, do you are you ever worried about getting omega three acid? Never, never do we worry about it. Do we ever eat nuts? On occasion, Mary will pick up some low salt peanuts or uh, uh, some almonds, uh, but not not too often. Uh, it certainly is not a weekly or monthly thing that we do, we just don't particularly care for them. Um, right. You know, unless you put salt on them, they're not very tasty. But we would rather eat things like we did last night, which was a it was a chili that Mary made and served over baked potatoes. Uh, that's what we enjoy eating. Uh, there was nothing be harmful in terms of my diet to eat uh, <clears throat> some unprocessed nuts or for Mary to do that. We've talked about our personal weights which, by the way, I wish those other guys would do too. Right. Yeah, right. I, you know, I'd love to. I remember one time I did a, I did a, a a conference in Boston, and Barry Sears, you know, the Zone Diet guy, was my opponent. And uh, what happened is the technician dropped our slides just to show you how long ago it was. Dropped my slides on the floor. And uh, I said to Barry, I said, well, "What are we going to do now to entertain the public?" I said, why don't we take off our shirts? Well, you know, it didn't go over well with the public because I was fat shaming. But he didn't do it. I wish he would have. Mm -hmm. I would say the same thing to any of the other gurus out there who are making recommendations is show your stuff. Yes. Anyways, Mary and I could easily eat some nuts and seeds. Uh, I showed you Kempner's weight charts here a few weeks ago. And I believe Mary at 105 was supposed to be maybe 110 pounds. You can find the weight charts uh -huh. in my November 2015 newsletter. She's 104 naked, mm -hmm. which by the way is, never mind, I won't go there. Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm 150, less than 150 naked, and I'm supposed to be 160. So we could add some more nuts and seeds to our diet without any issues at all. Without, they would be perfectly healthy. 
Uh, some people think we could gain some weight. Uh, we don't. We, we think, you know, we uh, look well and feel well at this particular weight. We could easily uh, uh, add nuts and seeds to our diet, as many of you can and may want to do. But uh, certainly those of you who are trying to lose weight, uh, eating a food that contains 90% fat, especially since you don't have to crack the nuts, uh, especially since you can just open difference. the lid and swallow them, you better be careful. Right. It makes a difference when you just open the can and just yeah. take them. I'm through the jar and half of it's gone and two, two swallows. Uh, Dr. Matugo, there is someone that is asking, um, I would like to know, is bread really okay to eat in order to lose weight? I get the potatoes and rice and corn and whole grains are okay, but I so often get told well by well-meaning people that eating too much bread is going to make me fatter. Uh, I give, a, a, I wrote a newsletter on it, and you could probably find it just looking up bread under the search. And I included in uh, uh, some of my uh, videos, which are free, a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in uh, 1978. It was about consuming bread. Uh, it was uh, consuming bread uh, uh, by overweight college students. You can easily find this. Uh, just mm -hmm. go to public. Oh, yeah, so, right. uh, this, this particular study, what they did is they took overweight college men from Michigan State University, which is important to me because that's where I went to school and also had my stroke when I was uh, when I was 18 years old back in 1965. I was at Michigan State University uh, at the time. I'm sure they were designing this experiment and they took overweight men who were eating at the, the dormitories which is what I was doing when I had my stroke. And uh, they took these overweight men, college students, and they asked them to do one thing, that is to eat 12 slices of bread a day. They had a, a one arm that was white bread and one arm which was uh, less refined bread. And that's all they asked them to do. They didn't ask them to eat less food, stay away from pork chops. All they had to do is add the bread every day. And by the way, this is in the Starch Solution book, so it's easy to find there. So they just had to eat the 12 slices of bread a day, and this went on for eight weeks. No other recommendations. So unconsciously, they changed their diet in all aspects, except they had to eat the bread. And at the end of eight weeks, uh, the group that ate the white bread lost 14 pounds on average, and the group that ate the brown bread lost 19 pounds on average, unconsciously. And in the uh, Starch Solution book, I talk about something called the Starch Challenge. And that is if you uh, doubt the starch uh, benefits in terms of weight loss, all you have to do is add an extra six to 900 calories of starch a day. And you could do it as 12 slices of bread a day. You could eat uh, four cups of rice, four cups of corn, three cups of beans, peas, and lentils, et cetera. Just by adding this extra starch, you cut the fat intake down because you don't have as much room for the fatty foods and you increase the carbohydrate intake. Remember, carbohydrates satisfy the hunger drive. Is bread weight losing? Absolutely, even white bread for overweight people. Now, do I recommend white bread? No, of course not. You know, it's much healthier choices. Do I recommend a, a, a whole grain bread without right. added oil? Yes, I do. Remember, bread is the staff of life. It has been the dominant food in Europe for a thousand years or more. <laughs> yes, <Right>. bread's fine. <laughs> what about uh, uh, soy milk versus almond milk? Any? Well, it'd, uh, have to be, it'd, have to, it'd have to be the kind, whether you make it yourself or not, or whether you buy it in a carton. You have to look at the ingredients. Many times they'll put oil in the soy milk and the almond milk. Uh, Mary, when the children were young, you should make her own almond milk uh, with a blender and a little bit of vanilla and water. So it right. depends on the, on the ingredients. Right, that's expanded. All right. Uh, Someone is asking also about uh, our cells requiring fat to function. I guess maybe we all, again, want to hear good news about bad habits. All the fat you need is in an orange. It's already, yeah. All the fat you need is in a banana. All the fat you need is, you know, how many times I've got to say it, God, nature did not 
make a mistake when he or she designed the foods for human beings. <laughs> In the this package. Been, this kind of eating, eating has been going on for humans, homo sapiens, for at least 250,000 years. Mm -hmm. And for hominoids, for 2.6 million years. You know, you think nature, nature makes these kinds of mistakes? Uh, consider that other animals uh, eat very simple diets, like the koala bear lives on eucalyptus leaves. Once mm. in a while, it comes out of the tree for some water. And the panda bear lives on bamboo shoots. Right. You know, almost every animal has a very simple diet of just a few, few foods, except for pigs and people. <laughs> <laughs> and there must be an ideal diet for pigs, but I know there's an ideal diet for people. Right. Well, Dr. Mandugo, I know that you have already done uh, two shows today and that uh, you oh, are very so, busy. So, person. Fun. so thank you for being here today. We will have to, to um, go ahead and quit. It's almost been an hour. We That's could good. go easily another hour with oh, questions, but we will uh, I, I enjoy it very much. leave it for another day. And I would encourage I would encourage you to just go to the website. It's free. Uh, just put in the search terms that you're looking for. Uh, the re scientific references are there. Uh, you question anybody who is telling you different, and ask them to uh, just to show my arguments. Right. Through the March 2009 newsletter. If somebody tells you you should not be eating starch. You should be eating fat. Just say, hey, well, here, look at this newsletter. And look at the scientific references given of basic science, not paid for by industry. Mm -hmm. And you ask it for their science. The first look at the uh, the uh, funding organization, because you'll find, like for example, the recent right. study on the Mediterranean diet uh, that was published showing a reduced risk of something I don't know uh, was funded by the nut industry and olive oil industries. Ladies and gentlemen, these are advertisements. Uh, these people are buying your mind with what right. is called exactly. scientific research. Exactly. Stop being lied to. Get your health back. Yeah, exactly. And thank you, Gustavo, uh, for helping me uh, deliver my message. Without you and your contribution, this would never happen. So, uh, and you're a great interviewer with uh, fantastic questions and patience. And well, thank you. I no. don't know how much I appreciate what you've done for myself and and the listeners. And I hope you share this message with uh, your friends and relatives. And you ask me how do uh, we convince people that this is the truth. How about by example? How about by example, like for yourself, when we met, uh, how much more did you weigh? Oh, I was uh, well, almost getting to my 280 pounds, and uh, uh, so I've, I've already lost 75, and so I still have a few more to go. <laughs> right, and you travel a lot, which is a, a problem, you know. Right, you it is. Done phenomenal. It's the same thing for me. You know, my top weight was about 230 pounds. Uh -huh. As I tell you now, that's when I ate enthusiastically at my mother's encouragement, a uh, healthy diet with lots of calcium and protein. Mm -hmm. uh, I, as I say now, uh, weigh in at fewer than 150. And most of my adult life I have. Uh, there was a time, and you can find this on the on my website, uh, under um, uh, the TV shows that I did for almost 30 years. It's uh, under About McDougal. As you look through there, you'll see uh, uh, some TV shows that I did. Well, I probably weigh 20 to 30 pounds more than I do now. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, I'll tell you why it is. It's because I was uh, a book salesman. I had to travel all over the country. Right. right. And uh, it's really hard to eat uh, uh, to eat uh, a healthy diet in restaurants around the country. And and uh, I have to admit, I, I gave into a few tempting things. I won't tell you exactly what they were because they're not too <laughs> Really personal business. Yes. And my alcohol consumption at those times was uh, higher than it you know, certainly should have been. And, uh, but, you know, I can tell you, I know exactly why. I'm yeah, not exactly. I'm telling you that uh, I've, I've been through some learning experiences also. But most of my adult life, since I uh, learned this at age 27, I have been somewhere between uh, 150 and 170 pounds. Right. So well, by example, ladies and gentlemen, you want your uh, husband and your your children, and your friends and relatives to eat well, teach by example. 
That's the best way. That's that's yeah, how. Uh, yeah. I'm going to ask these people at the obesity medicine conference uh, to show us some examples. They'll never invite me back again. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> they never, won't. They'll never invite me back again. I'm talking about teaching by example, I just I mentioned this to you off camera before, but uh, Chef AJ, who is a, a marvelous uh, chef and I, that you invite often, she's doing a cooking demo tonight that I'm hosting and uh, she's going to be showing some healthy uh, dessert for special occasions. And so I wanted to invite people to attend if they're um, free tonight at 6 p.m. Pacific time. How, and, how, do, how, do they, how do they get the link? Uh, I am going, I just put it here. So it's on the chat box. Uh -huh. um, but if not, people can email me and I'll send them the link. Uh, my email uh, is, uh, we can use the webinars uh, or webinar at drmcdougal.com and I can do that. Uh, yeah, you you sure. also mentioned that you put Chef AJ's lecture on your website, right? Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, it's on the website. It should be under videos. Uh... Uh, maybe expert videos, but uh, just look up AJ, uh, Chef AJ in the research search engine. It is one of the most, it, prop, it has to be tied with the most amazing lectures I've ever heard. Uh, do yourself a favor, uh, skip your favorite TV show tonight. Oh, yeah. After you watch AJ and watch this interview, It'll, it is remarkable and it will change your life too. <clears throat> and AJ is also a good example. And I'm sure you can get her to talk about this, about how eating nuts and seeds kept her overweight, dramatically overweight. And once she decided that she was going to give up the nuts and seeds, uh, her whole life changed. And you can get her to talk about that, too. She was vegan, but, you know, yeah, she really loved her nuts and seeds. Right, right. Well, thank you, Dr. McDougall. We Bye. will I think we'll see you next week. And um, uh, we look forward to it to another. It was, it was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, bye-bye.